it's nearly nearly three o'clock Eastern here, and I we've got some folks on already, so I think we could get started with um, introductions and some housekeeping here. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. My name is Craig Hadley. I'm the director at the Denos Museum Center in Traverse City, uh, and I've got the pleasure of having both um, Karen Bondarchuk with us, who is the artist of A Crow A Day, and also Kathy Kelsey Foley, who is the director of the Lee Yaki Woodson Art Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin. And so before we get started, I'll, I'll do a few introductions here. I did want to also acknowledge both Jason Dake, uh, curator of education, who's on with us today. Uh, Jason really is outside. <laughs> he doesn't have a virtual background. And uh, Chelsea Nimi, who is our audience engagement manager. Jason will be running a couple polls throughout the Zoom session. If you're joining us on Zoom, he'll be fielding questions from Zoom for our panelists. And uh, Chelsea will be handling all of the Facebook Live comments. So if you are making comments on the Facebook page, Chelsea will kind of be the conduit between Facebook and um, Karen and Kathy today. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Karen Bondarchuk. She is a Canadian visual artist living and working in the United States. Karen employs a broad range of materials and processes in her artwork. She's exhibited widely in the United States, as well as in Canada, England, France, Italy, and India, and has been awarded residencies in Austria, France, Virginia, Vermont, and as close as Illinois. She was named the 2016 Master Artist at the Woodson Art Museum in Wausau. Bondar Chuck received her MFA in Sculpture from The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, and her BFA in Sculpture and Video from Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, Canada. She's currently serving as Professor and Foundation Coordinator in the Frostick School of Art at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And secondly, our moderator today, Kathy Kelsey Foley. She has the distinction of having served as director of the Woodson Art Museum twice, her tenure separated by seven years. She returned to the Woodson in March of 1998. Kathy received her undergraduate degree in art history from Vassar College and a master's degree in art history from the Johns Hopkins University. Her museum training and corporate experience include stints at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, the Dayton Art Institute, Northwestern University's Block Museum. I didn't know that. <laughs> did you know David? Did you know David Robertson at yeah, the Block? I was okay. The founder. <laughs> sure, got it. Uh, and the Gap, where she <laughs> served as manager of corporate internal communication. Kathy was inducted as a fellow of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters in April of 2014. So if we were, you know, live and in person from the Millican Auditorium at the Dunnos Museum Center on the campus of Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City, Michigan, uh, I would then say, please join me in welcoming our uh, speaker <laughs> stage. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to, I think, Karen first, right? Yeah, Jason's got the... Uh, Karen, I'm going to hand things over to you and we can get started with your PowerPoint here. Okay. Does that Great. sound good? And uh, just a, a quick reminder for our panelists and um, our presenters here, if you could just mute microphones while we're not speaking, just so we don't get any feedback. All right. Uh, thanks, Craig. And uh, my gratitude to all of you for putting this together. I'm excited to be here and, and talking about a crow a day, which I had hoped to do in person and had, had intended to do so, uh, but a, a small pandemic got in the way of that. So, um, so the, uh, the conversation today is, is really around the body of work that I created over the course of a year. It's called A Crow a Day. And for those of you who have seen it at the Denos, uh, it, we opened it in January and uh, it's comprised of 365 small panels that measure about six by eight inches, give or take. And uh, they were created, uh, as I mentioned, over the course of a year. And I did a drawing every day for a year. And I did that 
to honor and to think about my mother, who at the time was uh, about four years into uh, her seven years with dementia. And I started the series actually at a residency in Virginia, uh, the Virginia Center for Creative Arts in, on August 1st, 2014. And for those artists out there who have ever been on an artist residency, it's, it's a glorious thing because basically you are housed, you are fed, you are pampered, and you're given a studio to work in. So you have nothing but your artwork to focus on. And so I came up with this idea to do a drawing a day for a year to honor my mother, to think about my mother. And for the first 30 days or so that I was at the residency, I thought, oh, I can do this. This is brilliant, wonderful, a drawing a day. And then my life really started again when I went back to school in September and I'm a full-time professor. Uh, I oversee the first year program in art at Western Michigan University. And I suddenly realized that I had bit off a lot. And so I persevered and continued to create a drawing a day until July 31st, 2015. And I really didn't have a sense of where the work was going to go, what the work was going to do, where it was going to end up until it was really completed. And it made a lot more sense to me en masse uh, as a kind of collective of ideas, feelings, thoughts, experiences around my mother uh, and just considering her life and my life intertwined in this uh, artistic way. So uh, the work really became so many things for me, but ultimately this kind of repository of thinking about her. And um, it has gone on to be exhibited extensively and uh, in 2016 was exhibited at the Woodson Art Museum uh, along with my uh, Master Artist exhibition, which was fantastic. It was an, an amazing experience. And then the Woodson Art Museum picked up the exhibition for national travel and it has been traveling ever since, uh, hence its current life at the Danos Museum, which I hope opens again so that people can actually go and see the work, uh, you know, in, in person. But um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, that's kind of a sort of general overview of, of the work of, of what I was thinking about with that work. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to open the conversation now to whoever wants to talk to me. <laughs> Karen, Karen, did you want me to flip through a few of your slides here? Absolutely. Okay. That, you that just tell great. me when to advance. And I'll keep going. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk okay. you through it. So this uh, is a, an installation view uh, from St. Francis University. This was the first venue where I showed a crow a day. This was in 2016. And uh, it gives you a sense of what that work looks like. Um, it, uh, yeah, it, it kind of became its own flock in a funny sort of way. And, and uh, you can go ahead and, and go to the next slide. So as I kind of alluded to when I was on that residency in Virginia where I started this work, I could make a panel a day quite easily and, and still have time to go out for a walk and <laughs> do other things. Um, but what I realized very quickly once I returned to full-time teaching in September was I needed a system in order to be able to produce a drawing a day efficiently and be able to have a life as well. So I started to do a kind of assembly line of creating these panels. So this is a studio view of me actually putting what were hangers on the backs of each of uh, the pieces. Um, it's actually now uh, affixed to the wall in a different way, um, thanks to the Woodson. But uh, initially, I had assembly line created these gessoed panels. So each panel has 
about six coats of gesso on it. Each one was individually cut and sanded and prepped before I could even do a drawing on it. So this gives you some idea of, of the labor that went into, into that work. You can go ahead to the next slide. And uh, this is just a couple of details from the Crow a Day. Some themes started to emerge as I was working uh, on this series, one of which was the acne hole. And of course, those of you who watch Bugs Bunny or any of the Looney Tunes cartoons will be familiar with the acne hole, uh, most famously with Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner. And of course, I cut my teeth on Looney Tunes cartoons as a child. And so the Acme Hole uh, made a star appearance in many of the panels. And it, it re represented my childhood, uh, but it also for me represented the unknown. It was, a, it was a kind of place of escape, but it was also a place where in the panels, I felt that my mother had gone you know, she had dropped through the acme hole and I had no idea where she was. So it, it kind of became this kind of loaded symbol for me, uh, both as a, a fond remembrance of my childhood, but also as this kind of fraught thing, um, this, this place of disappearance. So next slide. My mother uh, was a a girl in wartime England. So uh, she was born in 1932 and the war broke out in 39. She was seven years old. Um, and she essentially spent her childhood glued to the radio listening to um, the war reports, uh, Winston Churchill. And uh, she lived on the uh, west side of London. And so uh, the bombing in her area wasn't as heavy as it was in the East End, but still was, was something that she lived with every day. Like many children in England, she, for some reason, didn't, didn't go to the country. Um, we did and still do have relatives that live outside of London. And my grandmother chose not to send the girls, my mother and her younger sister, my aunt, uh, she chose not to send them into the country. And so the girls grew up in what I can only imagine was a, a pretty traumatic uh, environment uh, where they experienced um, continuous bombing, certainly during the Blitz. And then later on, the uncertainty of the bombs called doodlebugs, which would just come at a moment's notice, they were unpredictable. Um, and so uh, many of the panels ended up reflecting that part of my mother's history and past. Um, her having experienced this very traumatic uh, early part of her life. And uh, these three panels are, for me, indicative of the ways in which my mother disappeared. Um, and that's not to say that she wasn't there mentally or physically in the later part of her disease. She wasn't there as the mother that I knew. I had to let that mother go. And what it really required of me was accepting the person that was in front of me who had been altered and changed and the parts that I knew were gone. The, the woman who was extremely intelligent, she was a legal editor for most of her adult life, uh, was a voracious reader, uh, very uh, politically astute, uh, environmentally active. Uh, she really was uh, an incredibly, um, uh, just a, a, a very complex woman and that complexity was gone. And so what I was left with was this lovely human being who still smiled and laughed and I didn't always know what she was smiling and laughing at, um, but there was love there and there was a, a presence there. And so these images for me were really about that, about her uh, fading away. Um, and that part of my childhood that I remembered. So it was, it was my mother, but it was also me, you know, and the galoshes I had when I was three years old that I remember wearing 
sitting in the grocery cart and they would always fall off of my feet. And so my mother would constantly have to keep picking up my boots and putting them back on my feet at the grocery store. And so it evoked memories like that. Um, as I was growing up, I was a stamp collector and I, uh, I grew up thinking that my mother looked like Queen Elizabeth. So I uh, have these great fond memories of both seeing Queen Elizabeth when I was four, her train went through Newmarket, Ontario, where I was, uh, where I was born in, in the early years of my life, um, where I spent the early time in my life. But uh, it, so it, it really, the series was as much about me as it was about my mother. And then I think this is uh, the last image that I had put together of uh, snapshots from the series. Um, my mother uh, had Scottish blood and uh, was very proud of that uh, Martin heritage from her father's side. And on one trip to England, where she was visiting family, bought herself a, uh, a kilt and a matching vest. I didn't put the vest in here. And my mother loved her kilt, wore it at every special occasion that she could. And then over the years, she put on a few pounds <laughs> and still managed to squeeze into her kilt. And I know that she wouldn't appreciate this image, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really one of my fond memories of my mother um, proudly wearing her kilt and uh, taking on the attitude that uh, she, she had that good Scottish blood in her bones. So. And those are the images that I put into our talk. So, uh, Kathy, would you like to join me? Karen, I would. That was <laughs> a great, um, just a remembrance of all of the, um, the joy that we've had in working together, but also working with a crow a day. Um, as I thought about this conversation, about the questions that I might pose, I was struck by a couple of things and notes that I jotted down. One was that we met first in 2008 as, um, as our country grappled with a different kind of challenge that was entirely economic based. Hmm. And, and, um, and with your tire sculptural crow, you made references in part to the struggling economy and, and Michigan yeah. and those salvaged tire parts. And now, as I think about the unknowns that we're all dealing with and, um, and the challenges we're facing now, it seems like a crow a day and the ability to differentiate one day from the next, not unlike a person struggling with dementia, is just, um, is just a reality. Yeah. And from, from cartoons that poke fun at, um, at what day of the week is it to the reality that right now for all of us, one day kind of blurs into the next. And I, I just feel some odd kind of um, irony. Yeah. You know? um, it's a great observation. And, and uh, it, to me, drives home that bigger point that I've had to live with certainly during this pandemic, but in watching my mother deteriorate over the years in looking at, you know, back to that sculpture that I submitted to Birds and Art uh, in 2008. Um, just that idea of living in the moment, um, of looking around at what we have around us. You know, the, the sculpture that I created in 2008 was the result of me being fascinated by this idea of picking up the debris and detritus on the sides of the highways that was always there and looking around at families falling apart from the Great Recession, uh, 
people being in dire straits and taking this garbage material that was on the sides of the highway and trying to create something, some life out of that thing. Um, but, but being sensitive to the moment, being sensitive to what's in front of us. And so many times with my mother, I found myself reminiscing about the past, about who she had been and what she had been capable of. And having to recognize that I couldn't live in the past anymore. I had to live in the present moment. And it forced me into um, a kind of headspace that just needed, required me to just be, to just be with her wherever she was at, whether she was verbal that day or nonverbal, whether um, she was capable of having company or not. It, it just, it was a, you know, the way that I think I wrote about it was it was a, a real big lesson in uh, carpe diem, you know, uh, it, it, be in the moment, seize the day and, uh, and be present, so. Which seems also such an appropriate guidance for right now. Yeah, yeah. In a in an odd in an odd kind of way, you know. And and I think for for those of us who who um, who have been drawn to objects, you as a maker, um, to Jason, to Craig, Chelsea, to me as. Um, as kind of users and facilitators, the idea that we are connected in this way by Zoom, better than nothing, I mean, technology being kind of a godsend at the moment, but that our galleries are dark yeah. and um, is, is again, this odd, odd kind of uncomfortable feeling for me that I can come into the building and my coworkers, and we're, we're now back as a staff, more or less on a regular basis, in having these solitary experiences. And that's not what it's about. Yeah. Um, yet, I think the comfort that comes from accessing, just seeing your PowerPoint, is a reassuring um, sense that we'll be back one way or another, virtually or physically, to to benefit from um, benefit from powerful works of art. I and mean, we've all used this language of of um, of filling hearts and souls and minds with the power of art. A message like yours of resilience of um, of taking one day at a time, of making a commitment to one day at a time. Mm -hmm. But so often I felt um, as, a, as a kind of voyeur that people come into a museum, whether it's the Denos, the Woodson, look at an exhibition and we don't always encounter them. We rarely have a direct conversation with those people. Um, our gallery guards do, our volunteers do, and we don't always know what prompted a visit or how an artwork impacted them, taking, changing their entire outlook, um, moving them forward in a way that maybe they didn't think was possible when they walked in the door. Mm -hmm. And I think we learn from a Croa Day here as the venues in between the Woodson and the Denos have also experienced, that your work, Karen, has touched visitors in the most intimate and powerful of ways. Um, thinking about the journal here, and strangers, anonymous people, writing from their heart in response to what you've shared with them. Yeah. Pretty powerful. It is. And I had no idea that it was going to be a body of work that would create such a sense of community. And I'm so heartened by that. Um, it's, it's my mother living on. 
in you know so many ways for me, which is marvelous. Um, and you know the the journals that go along with each exhibition space uh, have been so amazing. Where, like you said, people are pouring out their hearts and their their most personal uh, observations in response to the work. And, and I really couldn't ask for more than that as an artist. I'm connecting with people in this profound way. And I am humbled by that. And I'm so honored that people are willing to share with me in that way. So. Karen, remember when we, um, when we were trying to decide what prompt to use, and it just sort of makes me kind of think back and almost really kind of giggle when you and Art and I were trying to, you know, we were wordsmithing the prompt for the journal here. And really, it needs no prompt. I mean, the reality is that I don't remember what we came up with or I don't know what, um, right. Craig and Jason, what you've used at the Denos, but, you know, we, do we, how much do you say? What don't you say? And really, the work, the work, um, you just need a, a pen or a pencil and the journal. And those who are moved need no prompt. The work is the prompt. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, it's been so amazing. People, uh, certainly people who have experienced firsthand a loved one with dementia, with Alzheimer's, with memory loss who, uh, you know, they've certainly commented, but pe people also just observing this idea of certain particular works that inspire them in a, in a certain way, or that remind them of something, maybe a loved one, or uh, an experience of a loss that they've had, and, uh, or a funny moment, or I've just been so, um, just blown away by the uh, absolute. Um, I well, how about how about crows? And I mean, so what about just you know talk about crows because yeah. it's not just in this work. Crows show themselves in lots of your work. Yeah, and you know there are those birds that I. Yeah, I've been making sculptures and drawings and all sorts of things around them for 15 years now. And I had someone ask me 20 years ago, you know, what do you see yourself doing in 20 years? It never would have been, well, I'll be doing crows in every, you know, possible iteration. <laughs> I just didn't see that one coming. It kind mm -hmm. of blindsided me. But they're those birds that are everywhere. They're practically on every continent. They are smart. They are annoying. They're uh, conniving, intelligent, uh, devious. They're so much like we are. And they have the brain capacity that rivals primates. And so we're now understanding through amazing people like, you know, John Marsliff and Tony Angel, who have been doing research on crows and ravens for many years, or uh, Bert. Uh, Bernd Heinlich, I believe is his name, the emeritus professor from Maine. Another crow expert, raven expert. Uh, you know, these folks have been opening us up to understanding that these birds have abilities beyond what we ever imagined. They, uh, they remember things, they, they adapt, they are co-evolving with us. So if we do something, they'll do something in response to that. Uh, the, my favorite sort of anecdote about that is the, the crows that were about 10 or 12 years ago, there was a story from Tokyo, Japan, in which jungle crows were taking over the city. They were getting into the garbage. They were making a really big nuisance of themselves because there's this ubiquitous garbage. It's, you know, plentiful and it's everywhere. And so, I think it was one of the one of the higher ups in the Japanese government was golfing, and a jungle crow came down and stole his sandwich from his golf cart, and that was it. That was the straw that broke the crow's back, so to speak. 
So the Japanese government responded by putting together what they called a crow patrol. And it was people in hazmat suits who went around destroying crow nests around the city. So they just decimated the nests and destroyed the eggs, trying to get rid of the crows. And so the jungle crows in response started to build decoy nests where they would build a nest and then they would go somewhere else and lay their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are all these stories about how crows and ravens have learned how to maneuver around humans. So in some ways they're even smarter than us. And we don't like things that are smarter than us. We are, <laughs> you know, we arrogate the superiority to our species and heaven forbid something should uh, upstage us. So crows and ravens have a big draw for me because of that, because of that that rivaling who we are and what we are and making us question ourselves. And, and also, I, I, I think about the fact that we tend to think, oh, it's just a crow. You know, like today I went out for a hike and I saw a barred owl and a scarlet tanager. That was thrilling. How many people actually come home from a hike and say, I saw a crow today? You, you know, know, because every time I walk the dog, I see crows. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So they're everywhere. But they're amazing, incredible birds. So I think we just need to sort of re-examine where our priorities are in the avian world. I still love the scarlet tanagers, but boy, those crows and ravens are pretty darn and special too. Seeing a, and seeing a barn owl is uh, pretty terrific too. It's very we nice. Have, um, <clears throat> a great horned owl in our neighborhood that I have seen in, over the last maybe four years, I've only seen three times. And I can, I remember them distinctly, but I hear him, I assume it's a him, but at just the right time and not always. I mean, not, not with consistency. Right. But the pine trees are a perfect habitat. Just um, talking about sharing the, um, the story from Japan and the sandwich thief um, reminds me of visually of Jamie Wyatt's many main crow works, um, mo many of which are about food, ice cream, French fries, burgers, whatever. Right. Um, it, you know, it would be great to have Jamie Wyatt on this Zoom as well. <laughs> Yeah, there was a story recently about crows having higher cholesterol because of the garbage that they're eating of human food. So <laughs> they eventually, they, yeah, yeah. Uh, wouldn't that we've we mm, yes have we given all of the worst of our things to those who might be smarter than we are? What an unfortunate uh, indeed, and maybe we need to start slipping statins into the, uh, <laughs> into the French fry packages. Right. <laughs> so did, did I see in the chat someone wanting to ask a question or be part of the conversation? I'm not sure. I did follow up uh, to ask uh, Michelle. She had raised her hand, but I'm not sure it could have been uh, just a, a fluke on the screen. But yeah, people are welcome to ask questions. You can actually just type them right in the chat. Uh, and I'll be here to, to chime in with them. Um, I was curious too, you talked a little bit about this uh, in terms of surprises with the exhibition, Karen, but I think the, the um, because it can be seen in a very weighty fashion, but I think there's also an element of fun to it. Yeah. And so I'm curious what your, what your thought process was with that. What, you know, did it start out being really fun or did it kind of get more fun as you went through each of the, the stages of the paintings? You know, I didn't set out to make it anything except for a way for me to think about my mother on a daily basis and to mark the days that she no longer recognized with her illness. So, you know, what's really interesting to me in looking back at that series is that prior to that, I'd really used very little color in my work. I've generally been a black, white, gray, achromatic person in my artwork. And that series, really brought on color. And I think part of that was just thinking about my mother. And what I also observed 
you know, post facto was that most of the panels, the, the coloration, you know, there are some pinks and oranges in there, but it's mostly blues and greens, which happened to be my favorite color, but they were also my mother's favorite colors. And so there were some things that occurred in that work that I didn't really consciously intend. The playful part, the fun, you know, the, the, the humor, that was really just, you know, it, it just came out. I really didn't, I didn't have time to think about that work, frankly. So when I was in the midst of that project, I was so overwhelmed at having to create a drawing a day that I literally didn't think about it. And so what evolved and emerged from that was just a spontaneous thinking about that moment in that day, thinking about my mother or something else in my life or her life or her past. It really was very freeing. I have to say it was, it was, it was one of the uh, most liberating projects I've ever done as an artist because I, I set limitations. Clearly, I had to do one drawing a day on a particular size with, you know, I mean, I was limited in the, in the kinds of materials that I could use. But it was so freeing because aside from creating a crow a day, I was, you know, it was carte blanche. And... Karen, you refer to it in the essay you shared with me as the ultimate endurance test. Yes, it, it was. It, 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 you know, it was a way to stay busy. And I, I, I wrote about that as well, that my mother all her life stayed busy. No matter what it was, she was always busy doing something. And often it was for other people. She served so many people in her life and sometimes at her own detriment. And... So it was a way to stay busy. It kept me, it kept my hands busy. It kept my mind occupied. It kept me connected to my mother in a strange sort of way, even though, you know, she was almost 3,000 miles away in British Columbia during the time that she was struggling with her illness. And that busyness was really essential for me. It was therapeutic. It was a way for me to cope with this devastating loss of my mother. And it was devastating. It was, it was unthinkable for me to watch my mother deteriorate like that. So yeah, it was an endurance test, but it was, it was therapy too. <laughs> Karen, if you, if you had to, if, could you describe actually um, a couple of days? So in other words, um, what the routine was like, whether you painted, did you work at the same time? And, you know, did you, did you get up in the morning or go to bed at night thinking, what am I, what is, what is tomorrow's crow going to be like? Or wake up in the morning and say, oh my goodness, today's crow is, so, you know, just how we're impacted by, it's sunny today. We all said that when we came on the call. Um, and, we don't feel quite as perky when it's dreary and rainy. And, and how do all those things, do, do you, can you go back, look at the images and see that, make those assessments, do you think? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or I'm reading too much into it. No, um, sorry, I slightly lost my train of thought there. Um, was it? It wasn't a linear question. <laughs> it, so just what, what, what your routine. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, during the regular school year, so I teach from September until April, essentially eight months of the year. And in any given week, I'm in the classroom at least two days a week. I'm at the university four days a week, if not five days a week. So no one day is routine. Um, so I couldn't really set a, a schedule for myself in that regard. I could outside of my university schedule. So over the uh, winter break, for instance, over spring break, and then in the, the summer 
that followed uh, when I was able to complete the series, I could get into more of a routine where I would create the work in the morning so that I didn't have to worry about the crow every day. But during the regular school year, boy, it was catch as catch can. Um, I was getting up, leaving, having meetings at school, teaching for six hours, um, and then I would need to eat some at some point. <laughs> and hopefully I had the meals made. <laughs> and I would often find myself in the evenings sitting down and drawing. And, you know, sometimes those drawings took me 30 minutes. They literally took about 30 minutes. Others took hours. It really depended on the work. Um, there were a few days I got sick. I got a nasty head cold. I didn't do any crows. And so I had to do catch up. And so there were a few days when it was just not going to happen. And so I did have to play catch up on a few days. But for the most part, it was um, just trying to catch an hour here, half an hour there. And sometimes I would wake up with an idea, oh, that's the crow today. Um, and there are certain panels that I know exactly where I was and what I was doing when I drew that particular panel. They just stayed with me um, indelibly. And others, I don't even remember. I, 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 mean, I literally walked into the denos and I saw one of the panels. I thought, did I do that? Did I, do that? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I guess I did because it's here, but I couldn't swear by it. <laughs> so it, it really, um, it depended on the week how my life was structured. So did you talk to your students at all about it? about the project? I did. And, you know, the irony for me, of course, is that two of my things that I constantly say to my students is, number one, even though I'm showing you lots of great images in this class, you need to go to galleries and museums and stand in front of the physical artwork because you never get the same experience. <laughs> and of course, now I'm having to backpedal on that because I'll be teaching virtually in the fall, I'm sure. Um, but that's, you know, number one, you need to look at artwork in situ, in the flesh, you need to see it for real. And the second thing is you should draw every day. Mm. And before I did the crow a day, I was really hypocritical. I was not drawing every day. And so I did talk to my students about what I was doing, why I was doing it, what my motivation was, and how it's sometimes not about the drawing. It's about the experience of making that commitment to doing that thing, you know? And young students are always about, well, what does the drawing look like? And is it good? Is it bad? You know, there's always that kind of evaluative thing going on. And really with the crow a day, I just let it happen. I wasn't too worried about, well, is it a pretty drawing? Is it, you know, it really, it wasn't about the drawing, it was about that experience of thinking about my mother, of considering her, considering where my life was in relation to her, of it was about so much more. So, yeah, um, my students got to watch me go through that, and I have shown them images since then. And I'm very much hoping that the Crow a Day is going to be at Western Michigan University at some point in the future. Fingers it's crossed. So yeah, yeah. Do you think? Do you think it inspired any students to take on a similar time-based kind of project, not thematically the same or emotionally the same, but the commitment part? Well, I, I, I force them to do that. <laughs> 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 and they don't always like it. Um, You're lucky when, students. When I, when I teach drawing, uh, I typically have students the first, I think it's the first two weeks of class, I have an assignment called 50 drawings. And they have to create 50 drawings in the first two weeks of class. And they find that to be overwhelming, but it's a way for them. To, yeah, but it's, but it's a way for them to really immerse themselves into the 
act of making marks on a piece of paper, which is ultimately a good thing to do if you're an artist. It's it's a way of processing the world. So, um, yeah. Did you ever talk to Bob Bateman about drawing? Just, I mean, that, talk about a random question. No, no. So, I don't, I, I'm not sure how I learned this tidbit, but um, if he, if he was here in, in 2016, and I don't recall, um, for the, op for the opening weekend and your master artist talk, I can, if he was here, I can guarantee you that he was sitting in the tent, under the tent, and he was drawing. He draws all the time. And I, I don't remember how I learned this, but somehow in connection with his drawing, I learned that he knows how to drive, but he never drives. Birgit always drives so that he can be watching, observing, always with his sketchbook and a pencil at the ready. Interesting. I mean, to me, who, you know, what does Ernie say? I can't paint even with a roller. Um, you know, the idea to be so focused and committed and to carry out 50 drawings in two weeks, whatever, you know, based on an assignment or because, because you're driven to create a crow a day to honor your mom, that passion and commitment to me is so real and admirable and just amazes me. Um, I just have such respect for it. It's just, it's just so honest. Um, you know, that the walk, the talk, I mean, you made this commitment, you did it and we celebrate you for it. It's Thank you. Quite extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, um, I don't draw every day now again. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, um, did I, yeah. did I, I didn't just force you into that, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I, I? But if I'm going to force my students to do it, I will force myself to do it. Um, because I, I do think that there is great value in doing that. Um, one of the things that we now have at our disposal, of course, are these little devices that we talk into and we take pictures with and we do all these amazing things with. And more and more younger generations and older generations too are using those as repositories like we used to use sketchbooks. And it's not the same, but there is a great value in having a phone and I have, so many things that I've pulled from my phone as inspiration um, that just remind me of certain things. And so in some ways, the, the cell phone has superseded the, the sketchbook, but for better and for worse, I think. In a different, in a different way. I mean, yeah. in this, in this um, uncertain time, I mean, the things that are coming back at, or coming back, that's a, kind of a, an odd sort of phrase, but um, you and I have been um, for many years, postcard senders and receivers, happy senders and happy receivers. Yes. So, and there's a period, quite a lot of letter writing and postcard sending going on now. And I think, you know, at the risk of sounding very Pollyanna-like, whether, whether it's about drawing every day or whatever it might be, or writing notes and postcards, I, I'm always looking for that silver lining and the positive outcome. And I think there are many things that as much as we embrace technology, because these are tools that I don't, I can't really fathom not having any longer even though my dictionary is right here next to my, next to where I'm sitting at my desk, my big, thick American Heritage Dictionary, there's something really accessible about being able to open a Google window and readily get information that you need or want or crave. 
Um, and while FaceTime is great and Zoom is great, I think getting a letter in the mail and a mm. postcard and imagine if it had a drawing on it or in it. And when, because my tenure here is now going into its second, um, its second decade, um, I've seen the change at the Woodson Art Museum from snail mail communication and letter writing Faxing, we don't even have a fax machine anymore. And artists annotating notes and letters with drawings, little doodles, even on a, even on a fax. Just amazing things, you know, like the old napkin drawing. Mm -hmm. And those are, we miss those. I mean, we've saved envelopes that have come from artists with little doodles on them. Um, you know, gone into files and folders and things. So um, maybe a silver lining now is they'll, we'll see more letter writing, um, postcard sending and drawing, daily drawing. Um, so I think that's, I think in that, in that respect, your commitment to a crow a day is a huge inspiration hmm. and your nurturing as as a professor um, and especially of first year students you know those fundamentals and basics I mean what what a marvelous thing your hmm. students know how lucky they are thank you <laughs> I do, well, I do we'll wanna up, we'll set up a zoom <laughs> I do want to jump in here, uh, mindful of the time here, and open it up for a few questions. If we've got um, comments or questions from our audience here, um, Jason or Chelsea, if you want to uh, maybe step in and field a few of those, uh, again, mindful of the time. Yeah, sure. Um, so I just have a com one comment on Facebook uh, from Lisa, who says, uh, love your work, especially the crow in kilt. Uh, your response to the schedule question, I didn't have to worry about the crow every day, struck me as a metaphor for the daily caretaking of the loved one with dementia. So I think um, making that comparison between you don't have time to think about it because you're too busy worrying about that person. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But maybe if you wanted to, to talk about that or respond to that. Yeah. Um, the the sort of everydayness of the disease. Um, I don't even know how to, to quite put it into words. Uh, it, it kind of defies time. And there's a, something keeps flashing on my screen here that's distracting me. Um, sorry, I'm, uh, there we go. No. Oh. I've got a poll in front of me. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. Anyway. Um, All right, we're just polling our audience real quick. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I do think that it, it really isn't, it, it, it never really was about the crow per se, although the, the crow, like crows in my life, are sort of ubiquitous. Um, but it was more about the drive behind it and yeah um that not seeing my mother every day was really really difficult uh when she was in the throes of her illness and um having that drawing a day uh in in some ways became my connection to her and it bridged the distance um so yeah yeah, I don't know if that's answering the question or if it would be. It wasn't really a question. I think they yeah. were just kind of musing on sort of maybe like the underlying metaphor there. Yeah, thank you. Karen, we had a, a quick chat, just a specifics about the materials used. And I know it kind of shifted depending on which panel you're working on, but could you right. talk a little bit about uh, what materials? Yeah, so um, the each drawing is on a, a almost six by eight inch panel. 
that, uh, as I mentioned, was uh, covered with six layers of handmade gesso. And gesso, for those of you that are familiar, would typically you would order it from a, an art supply store and it's an acrylic based uh, gesso. This was a traditional gesso that I created from scratch. So it was uh, gelatin, which is collagen based. You can use rabbit skin glue as well, but it's collagen and limestone basically put together, creates a kind of thick paste and you put that in thin layers onto a panel and you sand in between and, and then you have a really lovely surface on which to do traditional tempera painting, for instance, but you can do many other things on it. So uh, I loved that surface and it was really a forgiving surface because if I did something that I didn't like, I just took sandpaper and I just sanded it off. And, and it really freed me up from feeling like, oh, I'm gonna mess something up. You know, I, I just didn't wanna have that, that inhibition. So uh, it allowed me to work really freely. And so, you know, jumping back to that idea, the playfulness that you noted, Jason, in the work, I think that was actually part of it was that I felt free to do whatever I wanted to in that work. And if something really was like, oh, this is really pretty crummy, um, I would just sand it off and start again. Um, but the gesso is a really absorbent material. So you can do all kinds of really fantastic layering with pigmented inks. You can use acrylic on it. You can use uh, charcoal, which is my preferred medium. You can use graphite. You can use gold leaf. I used uh, press type lettering from bygone days of graphic design. I mean, it will accept just about any material and then each one is varnished. So it's absolutely protected. Um, so the, the material was really uh, so fun. And I'm still using that in my studio to this day. I've got some three foot by four foot panels that I've created with gesso on them that I'm playing with. And it's just a lot of fun to work with. Yeah. I just have another comment from Mary Cornish Hicks, who says, hi, Karen and Kathy. Hi, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what did, Mary, what did Mary say? She just said, hi, Karen and Kathy. It's great to see you. <laughs> oh. And there's a little bit of a delay. So uh, she might, I might get a response in about like a minute from now. So oh. <laughs> oh, very sweet, Mary. <laughs> Yeah. I miss you, Mary. You know, it's, it's quite extraordinary how our world, um, how, our, how we're connected um, with artists, with friends, with museum colleagues, with um, museum supporters and members. And it's, we've shrunk the world, is that the right way to say it, in a, in a way that's so powerful really I mean it um and allows us to be in touch and keep connected um I mean just through zoom real content like this but also a glass of wine or a drink in the, well presumably in the evening but maybe any time of the day mm -hmm. um and I, I think those are, you know, those are certainly things to celebrate in, in a way. Um, you know, always looking on the bright side, I think, at the moment. But this is a treat. I thank you for asking me to be part of it. Karen, I thank you for your friendship and your artistry and all those good things. And I look forward to us all being together at, in the in, in the flesh. Um, this is good, but. I know. I, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're with you there, 100%. And Absolutely. we'd love to have you here, Craig and Jason, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. So we could, we can make, we can make great things happen as a group, <laughs> I'm sure. So. Well, Karen and Kathy, thank you so much for participating in today's program. Chelsea and Jason, thank you for moderating discussion both on Zoom and Facebook. And to our members and to our friends who joined us both on Zoom and Facebook Live, um, both through the Woodson and the Denos 
Uh, hope you enjoyed the program today, and we look forward to seeing you um, at the Woodson and or the Denos soon. Crow Day will be up at the Denos through um, the end of August, and so I hope once we are able to reopen the Denos, whenever that happens to be, <laughs> phase one is getting our staff back in the building safely, but we do hope you'll be able to come and enjoy Crow Day still um, in Traverse City for some time.